name is Tiffany. I'm the Community Health Coordinator with Ascension Rochester. Thank you guys for coming. Um, Jesse also helped me with the event. She's in the back there from the Orion Center. Thank you for hosting us. Um, this is our second annual event here at the Orion Center for the Motherhood Matters event. So tonight we're going to get started with our Ascension staff. We have Nancy um, over here who's going to get us started. We also have Vanessa and Stephanie. And then in the back we've got Great Lakes Athletic Club that's going to close us. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to thank some of our sponsors for being here tonight. We had G's Pizza donate the um, pizza. We had Tim Hortons donate the coffee and donuts. And then um, Trader Joe's did some cookies and some other goodies. Yeah, always. Um, and then our beautiful floral arrangement with the balloon display is from Blue Daisy Events. If you know of anyone that's having a birthday party or family event, wedding, et cetera, they did a beautiful job. So feel free to take a picture and tag them. That would be wonderful. And we will get started with Nancy. Thank you. Okay. All right. Again, thanks for being here. So um, my presentation is on traveling with your kids in your vehicle. And, and I, I took like, there, there's so many topics and we could be here all night talking about them. So I just picked a few I wanna talk about very briefly, but if you've got any questions, can you hear okay? If you have any uh, questions, please come by our table back there. We've got all kinds of information. We've been doing this a long time and we can answer whatever you can throw at us. And if we don't have the answer, we're gonna come up with it. Um, so anyways, um, the th th things I'd like to um, talk about is rear facing, no poofy jackets. And I know we're coming into spring, but it's such a big topic. Um, and then me, meaning you, yourselves, as the drivers, what can you do to keep your child safer in regards to your driving habits? So, um, in, in regards to rear facing, I wanna show you this video. Um, you know, kids aren't necessarily just little humans, little adults. Their anatomy is still so much different from ours. Um, and then that's a big part of the driving force behind, you know, years ago it was rear facing until they're one, then it was rear facing till they're two, now it's rear facing to at least two, and now it's like rear facing until the, you know, maximum capacity of the seat. And so um, I just wanna show a quick video, and these are all like one and two minute videos to kind of um, show the point here. I'm here in the Axe Kid booth. AxeKid is a Swedish manufacturer known for making high-capacity rear-facing seats. And I'm here to talk about why we keep kids rear-facing. First, you need to understand how the body moves when you're forward-facing in a frontal crash. When forward-facing, the car seat straps or the seat belt will hold your chest and body back, but your head does not get held back, so it whips forward and back pretty violently. How well you can withstand that motion depends on two key things how heavy your head is, and how strong the bones are, not muscles, but the bones, running down your neck and back. When a child is first born, their head is about 25% of their entire body weight. When you're fully grown, it's only about 6%. I'm gonna be putting on this helmet, which is gonna make my head about 17% of my body weight, about the size of a four-year-old's head. The other thing that matters is the bones. Bones start out as cartilage. Cartilage is this stuff that makes your nose and earlobe flexible. When they do studies of newborns, the cartilage that runs down the bones in their neck and back allows that entire column to stretch up to two inches. Yet the spinal cord itself only stretches a quarter of one inch. So a heavy head on stretchy bones can force the spinal cord to do things that it cannot tolerate. So he's gonna simulate what happens both rear and forward facing. I'm gonna get my helmet on. And so, you can already notice my head's a little wobbly. It's hard to hold my head, but at this point, which simulates rear facing, where my body is going into the shell of the seat, my head, neck, and back are all staying in a straight line. All that force that I had on my head is now being taken off and offloaded into the shell of the seat. And now he's gonna simulate what happens to a forward facing child in a crash, where all the pressure's on the chest, He's actually having to hold my head because I can't support it. In a crash, my chin would be going towards my chest. I have a tremendous amount of pressure right now on my shoulders and neck, and that's even with him holding my head. 
but if I was a child in a crash, I wouldn't have anyone holding my head. He's going to put me up right because that's about all I can tolerate. And so in conclusion, rear facing is the safest way to ride. Do it until your child reaches the maximum height or weight for their seat. Their feet touching the back of the vehicle seat is not an indication that they're too big for rear facing. And in many seats across the world, we can keep kids rear facing till between three to five years of age. This crash test shows the same three-year-old dummy, rear facing at the top and forward facing at the bottom. I've paused it here to show the instant where the dummy has moved as far to the front of the car as it is going to. Notice how the rear facing dummy is cradled by the shell of the seat and the legs tuck them into a cannonball position, which is not a mechanism of injury. The forward facing dummy's chest is held back well, but nothing holds the head and neck back, and so it's thrown forward quite violently. Okay, so you saw where the, the car seat works almost like a hug. If, if you're rear impacted and it keeps everything aligned. Um, and then what she said about how much the head weighs on these babies, a quarter of the whole body weight is right up here. It's like putting a grapefruit on a toothpick and then attaching it, right? Um, so thank you. Um, so rear facing as long as possible and that keeps them safe. Um, what to wear, you know, um, our babies. Um, parents have a tendency to wanna keep them so warm and safe. Um, except not in the car. So as we, for those of you that are pregnant or going to be having babies, you will be coming into the fall season and winter, um, and there's a tendency to wanna you know, keep your child as warm as possible, but when they're in their car seats, the, the poofiness of those coats prevents you from getting it snug enough that it holds your child in place. So um, I've got a quick video I want to show um, in regards to what happens um, with poofy coats, if you will. I have small kids and it turns out I make this mistake every winter. I had no idea. So I'm in the boat with you. We're talking about putting your kids in car seats while wearing their winter jackets. You think you're strapping them in, keeping them safe, but you're really setting them up for possible danger. This morning, the new crash test video that'll help us all save a life today. This child dummy just went flying out of her car seat. And watch this one, the little body violently tossed forward. She was strapped in, all looked good. So what went wrong? Here with Sue Oriyama from Kids and Cars, and this is my three-year-old son, Blake, and you say I've been making a mistake a lot of parents make and how I put Blake in the car seat. I think you are, show me what you do. Snap, snap, and this feels snug to me. It looks like it's tight, but it's actually loose. Let's take him out and take the jacket off. So I do it. Yes. Take Blake out, take that remove off. that we'll puffy coat, there. then Come put him again. back in. Snap. Wow. And look how loose the straps are now. This is unreal. Isn't it? It's actually dangerous. To show you what can happen, we're at this official crash test lab here in Michigan. Climb up here for a moment. We have, as you can see, this child dummy in a winter jacket strapped into a car seat. And to me, these straps feel pretty tight. We're going to simulate a crash down this track at about 30 miles per hour. And let's get it going. Three, two, tuck right over here, one. The child dummy whipping forward. And just watch when we run the test again. She goes flying out, even her jacket sliding right off. Look at this. I mean, it's so scary to see up close. Miriam Maneri runs the lab. So what should you do? We want to see a nice, tight fit of the harness to the child's body. You should not be able to pinch any webbing up at the shoulder. And this harness clip should be at armpit level. Armpit level. That's mm -hmm. an interesting tip. Yeah. And no puffy winter jacket in the car seat. That's right. And it makes all the difference. This time, the child dummy is properly restrained. No winter coat. Straps snug against its body. Look at that. The dummy stays right in the seat. Come on this way. It works. I mean, that's the proof right there. And if you're worried about your child being cold in the car, here's the best advice. So instead of putting the coat on him, now you can put the coat over him to keep him warm. Okay. Or you can use a blanket like this. All right, does this work, buddy? Yeah. Thank you. A simple move to save your child from this.
Thank you to my son who had no idea what he was a part of in that car. No question, by the way, using a car seat is the best way to keep your kids safe. Just remember, strap them in without the winter coat on. And by the way, this is interesting. The same advice goes for adults, too. Don't sit behind the wheel. Really? Don't strap yourself in with the winter coat because the seat belt will not fit against you. It's the same exact thing. All right, so the best advice I gave in that regards, just put the coat over them or the blanket or with the new little babies, the little snuggle me's like that, that kind of encompass them. Um, and, and that'll keep them safe enough and, and also warm enough. Um, if anyone is so inclined, I have back there <clears throat> a, um, a jacket that you can keep on your child while they're in their car seat, but it's just because of how they wear it. It's, it's like dual zippers, and whatnot, but you can come back to our table and I can kind of show you how that works. A um, <clears throat> little costly, and as they grow, they need more. So the jacket on them with a blanket works just as well, but you do have options. All right, let's talk about your driving. I, I've always, every car seat check I do, I tell the parent that you as the driver um, have a lot of control over what happens around you. You may not have control over others on the road, but indeed you do within your own vehicle. So um, let's not be like this person. Every year, distracted driving causes more than 10,000 accidents in Harris County. Taking your eyes off the road for even five seconds is enough to travel the length of a football field. Eating while driving increases the odds of being involved in an accident by 80%. Don't be ridiculous. Tragedy can be just a glance away. Keep your hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, and focus where it matters. And that was maybe an extreme example, but we've all seen it out there, the eating, the smoking, and the driving, right? Um, so, um, let me get to there. This slide gets its own uh, page here. Um, there's a lot of that stuff on here. I'm not going to go over all of it, but here's what I tell parents. And I've seen um, they have some new devices out there. You know, the, the, the mirrors that you can put on the back so you can look at this mirror to look into that mirror to see your child. Um, your eyes aren't on the road, and, and you're, you're taking a look at what's going on in your back seat instead of around you. Um, they now have the cameras you can install um, to watch what your baby's doing. Hopefully, they're just sleeping or relaxing, right? As infants, um, they shouldn't be eating. They're still infants, um, so we don't have to worry about them choking. If they're crying, well, then they probably have a wet diaper. They need to be fed, and you can take care of that when you get where you're going. Um, but, but these devices take your eyes off the road. So you as the driver, if you're paying attention to what's going around you, um, you can have better reaction time to whatever it is you may be presented with. Um, just a couple of things, always wear your seatbelt. And um, if indeed you're pregnant, make sure it's down low below your belly. Uh, we don't ever want it, for anybody for that matter, we don't want it on our belly. We need our hips to support it down low. Uh, wear it every time and then um, let's see here it talks about don't drive impaired so okay maybe you're not consuming some cocktails and getting in a car but let's think about like maybe medications those can have just as much of an impact so know what the side effects are of anything that you may be using <clears throat> um, speed limits on the road are there for um, to support the road itself and the infrastructure around you. Um, so those are there for a reason. They're not a suggestion. Try to follow the speed limits. Um, practice defensive driving. That's where you're paying attention. You're able to react to what you're presented with. Um, get off your phones. Anything that may distract you, that's always like kind of a given. And I teach classes to um, new drivers as well, like the distracted driving. And I gotta say, as new drivers, these kids um, don't have the experience, but when we talk about what's distracting, they refer to their parents. They are watching what their parents do. Um, so don't be that parent, okay? And then, just some other topics I wanna really quickly go over. Uh, just because they sell it doesn't mean that you need it or, or that it's okay. So um, I get parents that come in to do their car seat checks and they have every gadget on the market you could possibly get um, to install their car seat. The mats, the mirrors, the, the shades on the side, all of that stuff. So the problem with those is that car seats are crash tested, just like you kind of saw with the uh, jacket. 
Uh, these other devices are not. So they are not recommended because there's nothing to say that they're safe in a crash. So save your money. Um, projectiles, things that are in your car, something as benign as your cell phone sitting in your cup holder. Think about if somebody were to pick up that cell phone and throw it at your baby's head. Anything that's in your car is poses that threat of becoming a projectile. So minimize what you have in your car, okay? Um, if you've got the vehicle like with the net in the back to go over all the stuff you can store in there, use that net. That way it kind of holds everything where it needs to be. Um, pets, they need to be secured as well. And then I have a picture here of hot cars. Now I know no one intentionally leaves their child in a car, um, but it happens every year. And unfortunately, you know, there, there's bad endings to some of these stories and, and um, caretakers just get distracted or whatever the case may be. So I want to point out um, this right here where it was a beautiful 74 degree day and it got to 130 in this car. So um, even if it seems like it's comfortable out, we got the windows cracked, it's never okay to leave your kids, your pets, or you know whatever in a vehicle. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, the other thing I wanna say for uh, new parents, if you're looking to get a new car seat, unfortunately, something new on the market are these counterfeit seats. And I'm gonna have Vanessa speak to that. Um, she's pretty well versed at it, and unfortunately, um, we're starting to see more of it. My name is Vanessa Mir. I'm an injury prevention nurse for Ascension Providence Hospitals, Southfield and Novi Campus, but I also run Safe Kids Oakland County. It's composed of a lot of different organizations that have something to do with childhood injury prevention. And unfortunately at our car seat checks now, we're, and in the hospital, we're seeing a lot more of these counterfeit or fake car seats. And really what that means is it doesn't meet US standards. So it could be um, it's missing a chest clip. That's a very common one. People are getting it from Amazon. They're getting it from Walmart because these are third party sellers, right? It's less likely that you're gonna get one of these in the store or from the actual manufacturer's website. Some red flags to look for besides that chest clip one is it being completely made out of plastic. There are certain pieces on a car seat that should be metal. Another red flag is it doesn't have any of the standard indicators, height, weight, forward facing, rear facing stickers. Um, it won't have labels on it sometimes, um, but we are seeing like brand names on it and then they just kind of make a cheap version of it that doesn't meet any kind of regulations. So I do wanna point that out and people are also getting these from um, their registry from the at the baby shower so they feel super guilty when somebody spends 400 500 dollars because you think oh it's expensive it must be right um and then it's not so we have to tell them unfortunately that it's not safe and it's not a great car seat i also want to go a little bit into medication safety and not to throw any grandparents under the rug here but 48 percent of all medication unintentionally taken. I'm not talking about like the Tide Pod challenge people, but if a kid finds a medication 48% of the time they take it unintentionally, it's because it was from a grandparent's medication. And if you think about it, they're not really used to having kids over the house, so maybe they still leave them on the counter or somewhere easy for them to grab. Um, maybe they can't see as well or feel as well, and then they're dropping pills on the floor, not even noticing. Um, another thing could be they leave it not just in sight, but in reach. So really we wanna put it now out of sight, out of reach, so that people, the little kiddos, and even the little bit older kiddos aren't climbing on things just because they see it. We have to also put it out of sight as well. I have a ton of stuff on my table about poison prevention and medication safety, as well as car seats next to us, so please come take a look and ask us any specific questions that you have or anything like that. Thanks. Where's a good place to find out about recalls on car seats? Um, recalls on car seats was the question. Um, when you get a car seat, it comes with a registration card, and I can show you the, the one I got back there. 
fill that out and send it in. If there's a recall, they will contact you. Let them contact you. You don't have to bother going and checking, but you can always go to their website um, and check there. And then, of course, there's a, a recall, um, I think the state. The, the National Highway Traffic Safety um, Administration, NHTSA, handles cars and car seats, all recalls. So they'll have a huge list. You can go by manufacturer and then by which kind of model it is to see. Your car seat will, if it's a good car seat um, and one that's been regulated by the U.S., it will have a sticker on it that has the manufacturing date as well as when it expires. So you can, because car seats do expire, <laughs> didn't know. Um, they will tell you how long it's good for. I've seen anywhere between six to ten years. So you're always good with the good, you know, the first kid. But then if you put it in storage or give it to your brother because he's having a kid now and it's been years. It gets hairline fractures in it, the plastic starts breaking down, the straps start drying out, so there's a lot of things that could accumulate to that. Yeah, so when they extended it from one year to two year to a minimum of two years to the capacity of the seat, what they did is they kind of looked at the discomfort of the crisscross um, versus the safety benefits, and the safety benefits far outweighed, and I think the discomfort was probably more the parents um, honestly, than, than the kids sitting crisscross, because if that's the only way they know how to sit in their seat, then that's how they sit in their seat. Um, so then once they've met all of the requirements of forward facing, that becomes a personal choice. We share what's best, and then we provide you the information, and then as the parents, you guys make the decisions. So this is gonna be all about breastfeeding. I'm the lactation consultant at Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital. My name is Stephanie Bauer. Um, so again, like Nancy, if you have any questions, stop me. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, we'll cut, try to cover as much as we can. Um, Leah is also at the table there too. There's two of us at Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital. So if you were here last year, this is a repeat, but I kind of want to point out that there has been some change with the AAP's guidelines. They used to say breastfeed till your baby's a year. Now they're actually saying, two years and beyond, the recommendations have changed. And a lot of people go, really, what? But that's the benefits of breastfeeding. And breastfeeding evolves so much, you're not breastfeeding eight to 12 times a day when you're breastfeeding a two-year-old, potentially, right? But it is a personal decision to make, but I just want you to let you know the AAP's opinion on it um, has changed and it's evolved as well. So, but everybody has their own goals. This is kind of a, just an idea of how many people start off breastfeeding, any breastfeeding, our rates are pretty high, exclusive breastfeeding a little bit lower, um, but again, this was back in 2019, I didn't see any updated ones this year, but a lot of people are trying to do it and we see that more and more, and I would say at our hospital, it's probably closer to 90% of moms that are breastfeeding are trying to breastfeed, so it's pretty awesome. Um, I just wanted to put some interesting tidbits of things that you might not realize that breastfeeding benefits. So we all know that there are benefits, but did you know that it can actually help reduce the chance of your child having leukemia? It helps your child prevent breast cancer in you and your child. We all know that it actually helps prevent diabetes type one and two. And we are finding out more every year. When I started to become a lactation consultant, we weren't sure about type one diabetes. We were sure about type two. Now we know it helps prevent both. If you ask me, I think it's a lot to do with the fact that breastfeeding helps build the immune system. And a lot of immune issues that people have down the road can be prevented by breastfeeding. And the more we breastfeed, the more the benefits. Um, there's actually stem cells in breast milk, which is amazing, I think. Um, and again, when I became a lactation consultant, this was one of those things they weren't sure, um, but the scientists did indeed find them. And so as you're growing your baby's brain and organs, these stem cells are helping your baby to grow in a way that other milk can't. So just good to know. It also reduces the risk of SIDS. Um, and as we know, like it just builds their immunities. It's like getting an immunization with no poke. Pr pretty cool. Um, so this is just kind of where a lot of moms are going for their information. Not that it's wrong, but you have to kind of consider where your sources are. Not all of it's good information. So I just always want to caution you, if, if you can find somebody like me to email or talk to, 
Um, find good resources that are reliable. Kellymom.com is a great website. So if you're looking for some good information, I would recommend that website as well. But just be careful where you get your information from because it can be a little slanted and maybe not as accurate. So what I wanted to focus on this time is worry. I think Leah would agree with me that every parent is, has worry when they have their baby. They're worried about the baby. And the breastfeeding mom is exceptionally worried. Is anybody willing to take a stab at this? Like, what do you think, if you're a breastfeeding mom, you'd be worried about? Go for it. Um, I want to breastfeed, like, yes. exclusively, mm -hmm. but I'm most worried that um, when I go back to work, it's going to be really difficult to pump and bring it home and have enough yeah. stored at home so that baby can get through the day without me. And right. those yeah, so we get ahead of ourselves, don't we? We have that baby, and all we, we think about is, how are we going to do this down the road? It's not a bad worry, but maybe a little impractical when you're in the hospital. But aligning yourself with people that can help you, because I could totally help you with that. Leah could totally help you with that. You can give us a call, and you can say, hey, this is what I'm hoping to do. Can you help me sort this out? Sometimes we have those conversations in the hospital because it's, it, it works out that way. Um, but definitely not something you should be worried about in the hospital. I always say, we'll have time for that later. But I love that we're talking about it because, again, you want to kind of be prepared. Anybody else? Someone, I saw someone else's hand. Go ahead. Um, do our breastfeeding worry about if your baby will latch on, if they're eating, if they're getting enough? Yes, you nailed that. About, um, yep. How to make sure that you maintain the, your lactation? Yes, if you're going to make enough milk. Yeah. Oh, man, Lee and I always get, what, what should I be eating? Is there a magic food? I'm like, you know, there's a lot of worry about a milk supply, right? Because we can't really see or measure what the baby's getting. So very good. Thank you for those. All right. So I said in here that parents are literally programmed to worry. So if you're worrying, you're normal, okay? So what should we be worrying about? What shouldn't we be worrying about? You know, I thought we'd kind of dive into that a little bit. Um, I like, we, we like to say that we want to feed our baby frequently enough, okay? Because we don't know what they're getting, so we have to make sure we're feeding them. So if you have a newborn baby, we say feed on demand. But then we get the parents that are like, well, they haven't slept, they've been sleeping for five hours. So aren't they supposed to feed on demand? So what Lee and I say is we should feed on demand, but at least every three hours for the first two weeks of life. Because a baby is actually trying to get back to their birth weight, and we want them to do this by two weeks of age. So now, knowing this information is going to serve you really well. Now you know the expectation and why, okay? Um, so, you know, getting some good knowledge is going to serve you well. So again, just if you're breastfeeding, gain some expect you know, get some normal expectations. Take a class, read a book, get some knowledge. There's so many people that take a birth class, but they don't take a breastfeeding class. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're going to breastfeed potentially a lot longer than you're going to give birth, right? So get the information you can. And it can be online, it can be going to a class. Um, and let somebody know if you're struggling. Don't struggle by yourself, okay? Um, you know, you can get into a lot of trouble that way. Um, if you do have a baby that's born a little early or small or has medical concerns, definitely seek help from a lactation consultant. That would be a, a, a thing that you should maybe, you know, look into. Um, if your baby's really sleepy and not waking at all for feedings and they're still in that two-week period of time, that's a concern too. So, you know, these are just, again, things to think about. Um, if your baby's not making enough output, and I'll kind of go over what to expect, but ultimately there are some things to worry about. Um, safe sleep environment, uh, making sure you're taking them to the doctor's appointment. You don't want to miss those. Um, making sure your baby have a safe car seat, like we talked about with Nancy. So these are the things that really are productive worry and things that you should really prioritize. These are the things not to worry about. So when a baby is a feeding a ton, that's normal. We call it cluster feeding. And a lot of moms feel, feel like, oh, the baby's just been feeding nonstop. I must not have enough milk. Actually, on the contrary, that's not at all the case. In most cases, that means this is normal infant behavior. It's exhausting, but it's normal. Um, if your baby's having adequate output and feeding, then you shouldn't have to worry about breastfeeding at all. All is well. It's as simple as that. I don't want people cooking, cleaning, or entertaining after they've had their baby. I literally say that to them in front of their loved ones. <laughs> I'm like, do not cook, do not clean, do not entertain, because you need to focus on recovery and breastfeeding. It's a big, it's a big job. It's a great job, but it's a, it's a full-time job. And then the other thing I hear a lot about is getting your baby on your insurance and making those calls. you got 30 days to do that, so put that aside as well. It's one of those things that comes up. You might not think about it today, but when you're in the hospital, you probably will. 
So this is how we know as lactation consultants how the babies are doing. First thing we want to make sure the baby is eating frequently enough, and then we're going to ask how many diapers the baby's having, and we talk about stomach size. These are the things that we do, because we don't know what your baby's eating, but we know how to figure it out. So, and your nurses do too. So this is kind of the data that we are looking for. So usually when you're in a hospital, you'll get a book and it'll have this kind of a chart. It'll show you the baby's stomach capacity. I mean, it's hard to imagine that a baby's stomach is that small, but it literally holds five to seven milliliters the first day per feed. That's, if you, know, if you translate that, that's a teaspoon, teaspoon and a half. So how is that possible that it's enough? But it is, okay? So knowing this information, I think can help calm people down so they're not as concerned. They know going into it. Um, what to expect. They know that day one, they only need to have um, one wet diaper, one poopy diaper. These are things we'll teach you in the hospital too, but understanding that is major because if you think your baby's supposed to eat so much in the beginning and my milk's not in and all these concerns, you're gonna worry like crazy, okay? So these are the common myths that we run into with breastfeeding. Let's see if anything rings a bell to you guys. So breastfeeding pain is normal until your nipples toughen up. Ever heard of that one? Yeah. Once your baby has teeth, it's scary to breastfeed and you should quit. Right? Heard that one a lot. Um, breastfeeding is very inconvenient, like it's a pain. Um, and this one, big one, if you, you have to produce more milk every month because your baby gets bigger. Does that, anybody hear that one? And then there are magic foods that make more milk. In fact, it's all over the internet. There, there's expensive brownies and cookies. There's recipes, right? All of it. Okay. So the truth is that latching and breastfeeding is not painful when it's done correctly. So if you're experiencing a lot of pain, get help. It's, something's wrong. And so we don't expect you to be tough. We expect it to be comfortable, okay? It happens, it's common, but it shouldn't happen if it's normal. Um, and babies, by the way, if you're worried about teeth, they can't suck and bite at the same time. It's rarely an issue, and it's something a lactation consultant can help you with, but it's rarely an issue. Well, you know, just so you know, just nothing to worry about. Um, when a breastfeeding is going well, it's probably the most convenient thing you could ever do for feeding your baby. You don't have to wash bottles. You don't have to warm the milk. I mean, you can travel. It's incredibly easy when it goes well. So um, that's another thing to think about. Um, I, always, I also like to put in there that moms produce an average of 24 ounces of milk from two weeks and beyond. So you don't need to make more milk with each month. And that blows people's mind. But the reality is, is it's about the same average throughout the duration of breastfeeding. The difference is the baby's stomach size expands so they can hold more milk and go longer between feedings. Okay? Um, and then by the way, there's no magic food. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you. There are things that we might say enhance milk supply, but the magic is really removing the milk frequently with the baby or with the pump. And doing it frequently is the key. I've been telling moms lately, if you do things part, if you breastfeed part-time, you're going to make part-time amount of milk. If you breastfeed full-time or pump full-time, you have a better chance of making a full-time supply of milk. So it's a supply or demand supply system. All right. But the number one milk or number one myth is my milk isn't in yet. I don't have milk. That is the number, is that right, Leah? I, we hear this every day. And I just wanna say your milk or your colostrum is produced between the 12th and 18th week of pregnancy. And I'm telling you I was pregnant three times and I never noticed that. It's not obvious for most moms. So if you feel like, oh, you're gonna notice something, you may not, it's okay. So as a lactation consultant, we will help a mom see this and experience this, and you'll, you know, we'll help with hand expression and different things like that. So, but knowing that, I think, helps moms settle down. We don't expect your milk to increase, what we call lactogenesis too, until about two to three days after delivery, and sometimes it takes up to five days. So I've had moms that'll say, it'll be maybe their third baby, they're like, I had my milk by now, and the baby's 12 hours old, and like, no, I promise you, you did not. I've not yet met any mom that has her milk in, like lactogenesis 2, full supply, by 12 hours. But our memory often fails us, and we think, right, and we worry. So I'm here to tell you that it's normal to have small amounts of milk 
called colostrum, and that's all your baby needs. As long as your baby is medically stable, that's all they need. Okay, so the important things are getting your baby latched correctly, having a comfortable latch, feeding frequently, watching the output, that's, that's the magic. That's the answer to figure, hopefully decreasing the worry in most moms. And you know, if you are using formula, if you are struggling, then that can impact your supply, then that can cause a problem. So, and I think Leah would agree with this too, a lot of moms worry, they don't have their milk in yet, so what do they do? They give formula. And they don't pump, and they don't breastfeed as much because their baby's full. So they're not coming to the breast very frequently, and guess what? They don't make a lot of milk, and they say, see, I told you, I don't have enough milk. But actually, they caused it, because they didn't create enough demand, and therefore, they don't have a lot of supply. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you're truly worried, ask your lactation consultant. They'll actually go through your medical history, if, you're, you, know, if you have any risk factors, but like 90, I think it's 97% of moms can make milk and have no issues. So it's very rare for a mom to actually have a problem. Very rare. Although that's all we hear about, right? We hear about the person that had a problem. So that's what we think about. So th these are some key points to consider. Just kind of highlighting what we talked about. But the supply and demand is, is, is huge. If you can kind of remember that today, after today, that'll, be, that'll serve you well. So a lot of people ask about bottle feeding. Most moms do a little bit of both, breastfeeding and bottle feeding. That's the, you know, we have conveniences now. We have pumps. We have all sorts of ways we can do it. So as a lactation consultant, I'm never going to say you shouldn't do it. I'm going to say there's some tips and tricks on how, what to avoid, okay? So if we give a baby a bottle in the early days, we can really mess up with their latch with breastfeeding. So we try to avoid it unless we medically have to, okay? So it's never a no. It's a let's try to wait and see what we can do. Um, the best window for bottle feeding readiness is four to six weeks. And giving a daily bottle is a great idea if you're gonna going back to work or you're um, thinking of just having the bottle be a part of the baby's life. If you wait too long, like an eight week old might refuse a bottle if you, have, if you wait too long. So the best bottle feeding window if you can wait is four to six weeks. But knowing kind of how to go about it is gonna serve you well and it'll help you avoid a lot of issues. Um, pumping, I, we have a couple pumps on our table over there. You know, getting a good breast pump is going to be one of your best tools. Most people can get it through insurance, so look into that. Sometimes you have to have your baby before they're actually going to give it to you. Um, but we can also overuse a breast pump. So, you know, again, just be careful with it. Gain some advice. Um, even those Haka pumps you might have heard about, if we're using them a lot, we can cause mastitis. We can cause oversupply. Um, and you could probably be like, well, what's wrong with oversupply? There can be many problems with oversupply. So the moms on TikTok that are showing you freezers full of milk and, and making you feel like you are never going to you know, be, be that good, they don't understand maybe what they're, maybe the problems that they might be causing themselves. So um, no judgment, just information. So um, all again, all you need is 24 ounces a day to really grow your baby beautifully. All right, so I mentioned a little bit about hand expression. This is something that I think it's been around forever, um, but I didn't learn it until I became a lactation consultant after I had my kids. So this is something that in, wherever you deliver, you want to learn this. It's basically how to get the milk to come out in the early days with your hands. And this helps the baby to be alert and awake and engage in the feeding. It really, really helps. It helps moms see their milk so they realize it's there. So it's, I call it a game changer. I think Leah would agree. Um, learning this has helped moms so much. It really helps babies to latch. Um, we can, if a baby's not latching well, we can actually get the mom to hand express into a spoon and simply feed the baby, which is unbelievable. Because back in my day, they were like, good luck to you. And you just wanted to cry. You know, you're like, what am I gonna do? My baby's starving. And then you get formula, right? This is a way to, just to support everybody. It's like pumping, but better in the early days, because when you pump in the early days, you don't get much out because your milk is so thick. Colostrum is like the consistency of honey, so it doesn't move as fast. It kind of you know, oozes, and so if you can kind of massage it out with your hands, it's not painful at all, and it works like a charm. So I also want to put on here things that you want to avoid while you're breastfeeding. In general, when moms say, what, what can I eat? I'm like, whatever you want. There's really, you can go back to eating the th foods that you've avoided, like luncheon meat and sushi or you know, all the things that they tell you not to eat when you're pregnant. You can go resume those things. But there are some things that could mess things up. 
So Sudafed or decongestants can significantly decrease your supply. I know that marijuana is now legal, but it is, there are some definite concerns about it. So there's an information sheet on the, on the table that we have if you're curious about that. Um, obviously, any illegal drug could be devastating, but in general, most medicines are safe. And we have a book actually that we refer to if a mom is gonna take a medication or has questions. So again, if ever you have a medication you're concerned about, call a lactation consultant. You know, we can help you with that. Um, definitely alcohol and caffeine. If, if used correctly, it can, it can be incorporated into a, your breastfeeding routine safely. So you just need to have a little more information about it. Um, but definitely, if someone tells you to pump and dump, call us first. And just save your milk and wait, don't dump it. Because most of the time, I mean 99%, it's gonna be fine. And I, we actually work with anesthesiologists that at our hospital that will actually adjust the medication if you're going into surgery if they know you're breastfeeding so that you don't have to pump and dump. So, I mean, we're just living in a day and age where we just have way more resources and information um, to help moms and really respect their commitment to breastfeeding. So these are just different ways you can educate yourself. Again, we're always here. We love edu educating moms. We love when moms call and have questions even before um, they deliver. So feel free to call us. You, you can get our um, card at the table. Are there any questions? Yes, please. What do you mean by hand expressions? What are they? So hand expression is when you use your hands to express your breast milk. Simple as that. And it seems very weird to some moms, but it is the most easy thing to do. So we try to teach it. And it, it is like, I compare it to, if you put a little speck of honey on your finger, and would you taste it? Right, I mean, it doesn't take much, right? Classroom's the same way. It's very flavorful to the baby. So if you can just hand express a little speck and glatch that baby, woo, does that make a difference, right? Huge. And then if your baby's not latching, you, if you can get a spoonful of that classroom into your baby, that stress whoo, goes way down. Because all we, we know, the babies need about five mLs, right? That's the teaspoon. So when you see that they get that, whoo, the stress goes way down, okay? So it's just a game changer for us. Did you have another question? Yeah, so um, my lactation coach, she said I could eat anything, but when I ate cabbage, uh -huh. that made my baby gas. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I'm just like, it's certain yeah. things that you really can't eat when you breastfeed. So it is not universal, okay? And we all have stories where like, I know every time I eat onions, I'm gonna pay for it, right? I could eat onions, but my friend couldn't, you know? You could eat cabbage, or couldn't eat cabbage, but I could. So you might find as a mom that you'll see a pattern that might upset your baby. So it's not a thing dangerous, but you might just find, yeah, they don't really like that. Um, but there isn't a lot of evidence to support that it actually causes gassiness. It might cause gassiness in us if we eat it, but it shouldn't translate in the baby. Um, so, you know, there's, I think they're constantly doing research on that. The only thing I know about is garlic. If you eat a bunch of garlic, it flavors your milk really strong. And so if, you're not, if your baby's not used to that flavor, they might reject it. But if you're a garlic eater, they're going to be like, this is normal. You know, Spi if you eat spice and that's normal, you know, especially if you eat it when you're pregnant, they say that the flavors are the same. The amniotic fluid is flavored the same way the colostrum is. So whatever you eat flavors the milk, flavors the amniotic fluid. So, you know, I could go on and on. But in general, the one thing I say to maybe reduce in your diet if you're a big dairy eater is reducing cow's milk. And the and dairy, you know, cow's milk protein. That's one thing that gets into our breast milk, and it's harder for the baby to digest. And if you have an abundance of it, some babies are sensitive. And this is why we wait a year to give babies cow's milk, right? Because we think about it, there's a lot of protein in, in cow's milk because you're growing a baby cow. They're huge, right? Baby human, not so big. So that protein has been known to kind of get into your milk and and affect some babies, not all. But I usually say if you have a history of this in your family or you're a big milk drinker, you might want to do some swaps just to be cautious. I wish I would have known that because <laughs> we ended up having to go into the hospital for a whole day because her tummy is tight from that. Because I thought the lactation coach told me yeah. that once she comes out, I can eat yeah. whatever. And I just, 
to go the ice cream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Especially when they're like, you could eat a little bit more because you're like making milk, so you burn more calories. So you're like ice cream all the way, right? Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Um, and by the way, if you want to know, it's about two to 300 extra calories you can get away with eating when you're breastfeeding because you are a factory, you're a milk factory, so you're burning more calories than you are when you're even pregnant, so, yeah. And, yeah. and still lose weight, by the way, and you, you know, so, yeah. You can't eat a ton, I mean, that's not a ton. What is that, an apple with like a tablespoon of peanut butter? I mean, it's not that much, really, but it is a little bit more, so. And I do know that moms who, you know, stop breastfeeding, they're like, oh, I can't eat as much as I used to be able to. You know, they'll notice a difference in their metabolism. So, so these are just some other things to think about. You know, we have a lot of information to share. So if you can get in touch with a lactation consultant, again, we would love to be that for you. But just know that there's a lot to learn and it's fun and interesting, at least for us. Um, but when you get to know these things, I think you'll have a more, you know, fulfilling experience. And we want you all to have a great experience. And we want it, your goals to be met. That's our goals, okay? All right, that's my information. If you want to take it down, thank you again. Thank you guys for coming out. I'm Regan Slocum. I'm the athletic, I'm sorry, the fitness director at Great Lakes Athletic Club. And I have with me Bethany and Jen, both are personal trainers and moms. And we're gonna work with you a little bit on fitness matters and functional fitness with your upcoming motherhood. Okay. Anyone wanna move with us? Yes, we have some demonstrations if everybody wants to try. We're just gonna go over a couple of fundamental movements that anybody uses. Our first one's gonna show you how to pick things up properly. So we're gonna learn a hinge. So you can do it, you can do it anywhere. What you're gonna focus on, the band under your feet. You're gonna keep your shins upright, slight bend of the knees, and what you're doing is pushing those glutes back. So you'll see her hands are staying right by her sides to keep the tension. A good way to learn this movement is to stand by a wall, and you'll just take one step away from the wall, push your glutes back till you touch the wall, and then stand tall. Sorry, I'm supposed to be the mic, by the mic. So that's a good way to kind of help give you that input to make sure you're hinging and not bending at the back. We're not moving the back, it's all the hips pushing back. You'll feel a nice stretch. See how our back's nice and rounded? We don't want that. Push the chest, stand tall, nice stretch in the glutes and hamstrings at the bottom. So this is a deadlift, it's a hinge, you can add weight to this, you can add a barbell, things like that. But what we're talking about here is how you're going to pick up a laundry basket off the floor, how you're gonna pick up some toys, anything. If you can start to learn that hinge instead of that bend, you're gonna protect that back, especially as the belly gets bigger and you're trying to support all that extra weight, pushing those hips and learning that movement pattern to pick anything up is gonna help you in the long run. Then you can progress it into a barbell, all that fun stuff. Come see us and we'll help you with that. Um, next, we're gonna go over a squat. So pretty basic. Um, you can do it to a chair, um, keeping the feet about parallel length. You're gonna keep the chest up tall. For this one, those knees are gonna come forward a little bit. So in that hinge, shins were straight up and down. For that squat, the knees are coming forward slightly. You can see Regan's doing it right to a chair, just tapping the glutes and standing right back up. Jen's doing it off a um, nice air squat. You can also add a, the band here where you'll stand on the band and pull it, Jen will show you here, to add more resistance. You can use a weight, you can, we got really creative over COVID. You can use a jug of water, you can use a case of water, all kinds of things, any way to add that resistance to it. Um, and this, you're gonna, you're gonna be doing this constantly. You're gonna, if you got more than one kid, you're gonna have one kid on your hip picking something up. You're gonna, Constantly you're squatting. So if you can get these movement patterns down, then your everyday life will become easier and picking the stuff up, just everything. Um, next we're gonna do a lunge. So same kind of thing. This is, you could be lunging down to pick up your kid, anything like that. You're gonna be on one leg. Most of your weight's in that front leg. You can do body weight like Jen is. You can add resistance like Regan is. Focusing on bringing that back knee down towards the ground weight in that front leg. Make sure that heel stays planted in the front. So you can kind of feel the difference in doing it if that heel comes up and it starts to shift that weight. And if that heel is nice and planted, 
the whole foot is flat on the ground. Um, yes, exactly, picking up anything. Um, just gives you some options of safe ways to pick things up, especially as you're getting more weight in the front and becoming more off balance. Um, next, we'll do bicep curls. These are standard exercises, but if anybody already has a kid, you know holding that car seat in that static bicep curl position can be really challenging. So just standard bicep curls, one foot in the, um, on the band is a little bit easier. Two feet in the band is harder. You can create more tension by bringing the feet apart. So just standard bringing up, you can do all sorts of, you can do half up, half on the bottom, half on the top reps, full reps. You can hold, do pulses, all kinds of things to kind of help prep that arm for holding that thing, holding the car seat. And when you are holding the car seat, make sure you're not always doing the right side. So if you're always holding that car seat in the right side and got that hip popped to the side, even holding the baby, we naturally, even after all of our kids are grown, you're still bouncing, you're still holding that hip to the side with that baby on there. You don't wanna cause imbalances through everything. So try your best to switch sides or be conscious of it that you're not got that hip popped out and you're nice and level. Same with the car seat. Don't always carry it in your right. Switch it up every once in a while so you don't create those imbalances. Okay, next two, we're gonna talk about more posture, especially when you're nursing, you're in that hunched position. You don't even realize it, but for hours in a day, you're in that hunched position. So what happens is that chest gets tight, these muscles in the back get lengthened, so you get this rounded shoulder look. We don't want that, we wanna pull the shoulders back. So a couple ways we can do that, we can strengthen the back by doing face pulls. So same thing, the closer your hands are, the harder it's gonna be. So you kind of find a tension. You want those shoulders down and back, away from the ears, pulling apart. You should feel it right across the back, back of the arms. Doing reps like this will help, keep, help strengthen those back muscles across the top of the back and arms. And then you can also stretch the chest. So it's a two point. When you're in this position, all the muscles in the chest are shortened in this position. So we wanna open those up. Think about chest nice and tall. You can use a doorway stretch, get that arm up, stretching across. I don't know if you can do it in here, but like that, you'll lunge. You'll be kind of in a um, turning away from the muscle. You'll feel a nice stretch. You can move the arm up and down, see where you feel it best, holding those stretches. So two parts, do both to kind of even out. Um, last one we're gonna do is a lat pull. So this is gonna be for posture and back as well. Also core, you'll notice how their core is nice and stretched in this position. You're keeping the tension. If you imagine it like a pull-up bar, you're pulling it right to the chest, keeping that tension coming back up. So pulling those elbows right to the back and you'll feel it on the sides of your back, a little bit on the upper back, things like that to help strengthen the back to counteract all this extra hunched position, extra weight in the front. Um, these are all exercises that all of our clients do. These aren't like pregnancy specific. You're not in any kind of, if you're not in any kind of restricted capacity from a doctor, these are all great exercises to do for anybody, but especially to prepare you for motherhood and all of the things that come along with it. So if you have any other questions or want any more demonstrations on these exercises, you can see us in the back. Any questions here? That was a lot of information I can talk a lot about that. <laughs> okay.